this complete worship that we're to offer God, the Son of God, has to come from the depth of our heart. It is a bowing before God, I think, in full appreciation of all that's been accomplished on our behalf. To me, this is the real crux of worship. When we raise our hand to God and we sing or we pray, we're recognizing how great he is and how much we need him and what he has done for us already. Amen? Amen. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. It's all because of him. In verse 7, of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. The angels, as the ministers of God, recognize Christ's supremacy as the Son of God and are powerful messengers worshiping him in spirit as ministers of, of God himself. And a special emphasis in the Greek language is placed on the word minister. The word denotes a servant in a religious sense. Normally, in describing someone who's a servant would be a doulos, uh, would be, excuse me, Greek word doulos would be a servant, a slave. You have diakonon, which is for a deacon. And you have this Greek word, which denotes emphasis of a religious, in a religious sense, like a priest would worship. It emphasizes worship, the word minister that's used here. The angels are described as a flame of fire, and the emphasis is being placed on a consuming fire. In the presence of God, the angels are absolutely and fully aware of the honor and worship that Jesus deserves as God, and they give it to him. If we could only view the worship of Christ from, from a totally submissive mind, a desire and a desire to honor him. Our lives would be different. Our worship would be different. We'd open our mouth to sing. We'd be strengthened in our lives as we focus on him and not ourselves. We would desire to be with God's people to worship together and to present ourselves daily as a living sacrifice. All of these things would be the natural things to do just because of a, a proper worship. And if we're going to worship God, the scripture says we have to worship him in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> right doctrine, right attitude. <clears throat> God, I can't wait to get to your house <clears throat> on Sunday. Just an opportunity for an hour or two to devote myself completely to honoring you and worshiping you and praising you and singing and studying your word because I know these are small things in my life but they're critical things in my life that have to be done all the time. And I need a constant reminder of the greatness of who you are. I need to be constantly reminded of your word and I need to be constantly in prayer. That's why it says to pray without ceasing. I need to be refreshed in my spirit. I need to learn to have more joy. I need to learn to be stronger in my faith. How does this happen apart from corporate worship? <clears throat> to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Some beautiful times between God and myself <coughs> have been when I was by myself. But the majority of the worship that we experience is together. It's different when we're here with other Christians. We're surrounded by voices of people lifting their hearts to God. To think that the Father, God the Father, says to the Son, 
Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. I've been studying Greek since my seminary days back in 100 years ago. And I have translated this passage in Hebrews 1.8 so many times and memorized it because of its critical teaching. But this last month when I was studying for today, I noticed something I'd never seen or remember seeing before. And I want to share it with you because it, it puts everything together. In verse 8, the writer of Hebrews shifts from the normal prose narrative that he's writing. And he shifts to what is called direct address. Sometimes we talk just to talk. But if I want to talk to somebody, to you, I'm speaking directly to you. That's direct address. I'm not speaking about you, I'm speaking to you. So in Hebrews 1 8, but he, but unto the Son of God, Son, he, God, says, Thy throne, he says to the Son, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of, of thy kingdom, yours. The son of God. So the, the writer of Hebrews, when he shifts to direct address, is quoting from Psalm 45, where David was extolling the greatness of Messiah as loving righteousness and hating wickedness. And it is this Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is crowned with glory and honor. So when it says, but unto the Son, he saith. The word unto is a Greek word which is a preposition. And it means that if I am, if I was just using Robert as an example, if I write Robert a letter, I'm talking to him technically, but in writing, it's a different preposition. If I use this preposition, the word pros, that means that Robert and I are speaking face to face with one another. Personally. He sees me, I see him. Literally, when it says, unto the Son he saith, literally, it is before the presence and face to face with the Son I speak. If you can picture this in some way which is impossible, the Father and the Son face to face, and the Father says to the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever. It becomes an, not just an amazing statement, but an extraordinary and a complex statement. Powerful, you know, just in the small way that it's written. And the conclusion is inescapable. The Messiah, the Lord Jesus, is addressed literally as God. And if you read the Greek text without translating it, in the, in the sequence of the words, this is what the Father says to him. The throne belongs to, basically, the God. So when you read this, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. The throne, the, uh, the God. He's speaking, the Father speaks to the Son and calls him the God. Wow. Now, we, some people say there's no one like anybody else. You are unique. Frank is unique. Even if he's sitting next to Frank, they're both unique. But they're both different. And I say there's only one Frank that's going to have a birthday here and be 90? Oh, I thought you were like 70. I don't know if anybody else is going to live that long, Frank, but I'm glad you're here. Amen. He is the Frank. Not just Frank. He's the Frank because he's the only one. Uh, this is not the way they would speak to you in Greek. But when it's talking about God, it is the throne, the God. That's the way the Father sees the Son. The only, unique, absolutely one and only. 